Today's keynote will be joined by artistic director of the show, Tae Choi, New York-based professor of media studies, Alexander R. Galloway, and Amy K.S. Chan, Hong Kong-based professor and scholar. Hi, thanks, Bruce, for the introduction. And first of all, thanks to my fellow panelists, Alexander and Amy. I'm really, really happy to connect with you through this opportunity. And thanks to the attendees. Uh, there's close to 100 folks who are signed up right now. Um, I can't see you, but I know that you're there. And you know, hoping that we share some interesting ideas through this opportunity. So the format of this evening or morning for some of the folks in the other side of the world would be that I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes and pass off to Alex and Amy will introduce some of her work and we'll have a group discussion. So the total format will be about 90 minutes. And if you have questions, um, you know, as Bruce said, please use the chat box, we'll be monitoring and hopefully we get to answer some of your questions. And I'll be sharing my screen in just a minute. Okay. So let's begin our journey. And I have a drawing of a zero and one, and there's a little person. That person tends to be me. Um, <laughs> And we are walking someplace. Uh, I guess we'll figure out where we're gonna go. I wanna preface the talk by saying that this event is part of a very large and complex project that the Center for Heritage Arts and Textile has initiated a few years ago. And this is the forum and there will be exhibition which will open in May and then there will be a series of workshops that are going to happen on site in Hong Kong, as well as some of those are going to be online. The exhibition includes some of my work, but it is on, it, it's on weave of various artists uh, who are either my collaborators or some folks that I've been meaning to work with uh, some of the my inspiration when it came to textile technology and its relationships. I won't have a time to cover all of their work, unfortunately, but I just want to preface by saying that their work has been integral for this conception of the show. And if you get to visit Hong Kong and watch or see the show, you'll meet their work. Today, I want to start by talking about wires, especially uh, wire wrapping. It's a, it's a form of engineering that is very archaic and people don't do it anymore. But it's, it's a form of craft that I'm very fascinated by. Here is an image of a 8-bit computer, which I made by wrapping around some wires. So on the top surface, it looks like a 1980s game console or a you know, hobbyist uh, little project. And in some, some sense it is. It, I just was really curious how computers are built. So I thought the best way to understand would be to make my own. When I started, I just did not realize how labor intensive this process would be of wrapping wires around um, you know, logic gates. So these are um, these small chips that perform either binary operations such as uh, adding or subtracting or comparing two bits of information. And when you connect these logic gates and in this sense, it's actually like a series of transistors that are like baked into these chips. You're literally completing the circuit 
and circuit is just the path in which electrical signals could travel. So I had these very primitive material and I had some time in 2015 to make a computer. And at first I started with a very simple machine like a one bit computer, which just add one bit. So if you add one to one in binary, it becomes one zero, which is two in decimal. And I was also able to make a clock that just oscillates between zero and one, as well as a memory, which is a flip-flop. It just holds a bit of information. This particular image um, is, is from more complex version, which could hold, um, it went through 10 cycles. So from zero to nine, so you can see that little uh, display. And I was able to give a uh, input of four bits. So by pressing that um, tiny button, you can either put zero or one and it goes through the cycle and replace that memory. So it's a form of a random access memory because we can pull that information from this circuit and then replay it. Making the computer was fascinating because I was able to draw the di diagram and like to understand the computing I had to draw and to tell the story about the computers I had to write poetry because some of those are quite mathematical and logical but a lot of times there's this imaginative jump between logic to something more aesthetic. That's when I got really excited about this idea of a poetic computation, which means, for, first, it means the poetics of the code itself, like some code or electronics are just really interesting as a literary material. And then the second it will be the poetic effects of the code, like the experience that you create with circuitry, code, computers, or the internet. This ideas of zeros and ones, it fascinates me because the ability to express complex numbers and complex emotions or ideas through this very simple logic is very fascinating, the scalability of that. And it's also a little troubling because there's so many similarities between the ways that societies see certain problem, like it's either good or bad, it's either white or black, it's very uh, reductive binary. And I'm really interested in the space between the zeros and ones and what is possible between those numbers. With the chat team, the museum's team, I organized the coding workshop for the uh, blind and visually impaired students of Hong Kong. So we taught the basic HTML, which is the standard for the web language. And I was really interested in um, one type of code, uh, one type of tag in HTML, which is a pre-tag, P-R-E. And that stands for pre-formatted tag. And that tag is usually used to display code in its ASCII original form, like the ways that the characters are formatted looks like it's almost like machine readable, like it's not rendered as a kind of the um, other type traditional sense of the HTML. It allows spacing and indentation and different kind of paragraph structure that the uh, um, you know HTML does not usually support. So you can write some text, and you it looks like you could compose a text like a poetry. And this tag was really beautiful to work with for the blind students, because it allowed them to compose text in a spatial manner. 
And the students had a varying degree of sight. Some students were able to see relatively well, other students were, um, you know, they were born blind. So they relied on the uh, screen reader, which reads the text on a browser or code editor. In this, in this case, you see a really amazing poem by a student named Haley. She was playing with the screen reader and the screen says, two beds, a piano, a ukulele, a few chairs. So she composed a poem about her room at first, and then she found out that the screen reader creates a rhythm when she breaks away the text. So it became like a, almost like a song that she was playing with the computer. So a piano became a pian, O oh, and U A Ukule Ele, a few a, a few U chairs. This is Haley. And on the right side of Haley, you see a laptop pouch that we created. And that's just the ASCII pattern that I created with some stars. But this was the beginning of a collaboration with the students and a factory um, kind of a textile specialist in Hong Kong called um, Chemtex. And to talk about that, I need to talk a little bit about knitting. So in knitting, the textiles run parallel to each other. And I've, I learned to knit when I was in school and I really enjoy the repetitive aspect of it. And there's a meditative elements of knitting as well. But I was not really good at it. And I think I learned that there's a lot of a spacing and kind of the, the tension of the knit that is really important. The factory that the museum chat has uh, connected me to is called Chemtex. And they have these really industrial knitting machine that's state of the art, it's fully automated. And you have this CAD software, like computer-aided design software that you simulate the knit. And they use these machines to create some things like sportswear that are like very like, you know, kind of volume, it has a volume to it. So it's not a flat textile. And they all, they're also really interested in like um, these transform transforming textiles. So it just changes shape according to how you pressure it. This machine was really impressive just by its scale and how smart it was. But similarly to the history of computing, the human labors play a really integral part of making anything possible. And just like the computers, especially the early computers, there were a lot of labor involved, um, especially women who perform these either operations or part, they complete the missing parts, missing link between the machines. So I met some of the workers in the factory and they were going through all of the knit one by one to make sure the needles don't break, um, making sure that the knits are properly aligned. And I thought there was a really interesting connection between the computing, the labor, especially the labor aspect of it as well as the this textile creation. One of Haley, the one of the students, um, her design became a laptop cover. And this is a piano. <laughs> she made a piano out of the ASCII. And I wanted to work with knits because it's quite tactile. And we are gifting these bags to the students and also making these as a product that we can sell in which the, the profit will go back to the school. This is one of the commission from chat that I've been working on. And um, it's a very large flag that is made out of a jacquard knit. And there's a picture of Joyce, who is one of the staff member um, as a scale uh, to show the scale of the flag. And I'm really interested in how images and text become textile. 
And this process of transferring a two-dimensional thing into something three-dimensional. Here's a close-up of the knit. And this, this particular one is uh, designed with the idea of uh, unlearning, an idea of like questioning how we learn and what we learn. The particular knit structure is, you know, it's the engineers and the Chemtex has worked on the design based on the uh, bitmap image that uh, I worked with my designer collaborators. So there's not necessarily a computation involved in the design of the uh, flag, but there's a lot of the process in which we are collaborating with the machines. That design is part of the drawings that I do um, that are just walking chairs. And for me, walking chairs are symbols of learning and unlearning, which is questioning what we learn and thinking about the agency of students and idea that students, we are lifelong students and that we are always learning. This is from one of the wall graphics for the exhibition, where it says the words text and texture share a common lineage stemming from the Latin texere, which means to weave. And I think that connection is fascinating. There, I'm still trying to process that connection to text and texture. One of the artists that we've invited, her name is Amor Munoz, based in Mexico City. She's been exploring that connection between textile and code uh, in a very elegant and thoughtful ways. So here is a little um, paper, which the audience can use to decode the binary information. So the binary is the ways of representing numbers using just zero and one. So those uh, numbers on the left are that. And then that relates to the ASCII alphabets like ABC. And we can represent the binary through just the black and white um, squares. So those, are, those become the textile patterns in which she works with the weavers, she, she weaves herself too, but in this case, I think she's worked with different weavers to create a large scale textile that, is, that has the encoded information. And oh, I, I also try to learn to weave for this exhibition. I was not very successful. <laughs> um, this knit, uh, this weave is actually created by my collaborator, Yesam An, and um, the credit is wrong. It should be a weave, not a uh, knitted fabric. Weaving is so hard. And I'm going to ask Alex to talk a bit more about his weaving. I think he was a little bit more successful with the weave. It's really unforgiving. And if you mess up one thing, you are just <laughs> you have to undo the whole thing or just embrace that as part of the weave. And Alex and I went back and forth about the connection between code and weave. And sometimes they seem similar. Like I know people love to talk about that history of, you know, Jacquard Loom and like Ada Lovelace and et cetera. But sometimes it feels so different because in computers, you can like undo things. You can create files, you can delete files. But I think Alex and I had a little bit of disagreement where he thinks like computers are still unforgiving too. And like, if you mess up one line of code, it totally um, mess up the rest of the operation. And I said, how about JavaScript? It kind of ignores all the mistakes you make. <laughs> and like, there are codes that are forgiving. So I guess we're gonna talk a little bit more about that differences and connections. But in this particular weave created by my collaborators and studio team members, um, we try to make this 
chair into a weave and try different um, styles. And I'll just say that it took a long time, much longer than I thought. And I think that arduous process is revealing about the, the weight of labor that is involved with textile creation. And people think internet is this ephemeral or like almost like a intangible thing, but internet is essentially just computers that are talking to each other. So the internet or the, all these networks are almost always connected through physical cable. The point in which the internet becomes wireless is actually quite short, like from Wi-Fi router or cellular tower to your devices. Like you can think about the whole world is wrapped around in fiber optic cables, just talking to each other. I've been trying to think about exploring that physicality of the internet in a performance. So in this piece, uh, Distributed Web of Care, I invited the uh, attendants of the performance to be part of the network. And we had performative prompts to form the network in a centralized way or decentralized way or distributed way. And I worked with choreographers to expand on those concepts. And I had a chance to do the same performance in Hong Kong in 2018. And this is when I met uh, Mizuki Takahashi, who's the chief curator of the chat. And I think when we did this performance, something must have clicked for her, the connection between technology and textiles. Yeah, I've been looking at these photos and I, I feel quite nostalgic just because Nobody's wearing face masks. And <laughs> I was able to get all the strangers to touch, basically touch each other um, in a large stadium. So definitely a pre-COVID-19 situation. In, in the exhibition, we are inviting various activists, um, organizers, and artists to explore this concept of care in a more radical way and those who already practice that. I wanna talk about Rebirth Garments who are this amazing fashion designer based in Chicago and they make custom garments for disabled and queer folks. And they use their own, um, you know, tailoring skills to make clothes for people who have trouble using mass-produced garments. And I was able to see their performance in New York um, last year. And I was just so, so inspired and touched about how the garments transformed what, how the performers were feeling. So I could just see, I could experience the internal transformation of the people involved by wearing this garment and partying and dancing. I'm really delighted that we can invite Rebirth Garments to Hong Kong and they're going to have a fashion party in Eaton, which is a hotel and a venue um, in July. I, I think that will be really fantastic. I want to finish off by uh, reading an excerpt from a piece that I worked on this year, uh, which is called, titled Community Code. In Donna Haraway, staying with the trouble, making kin in the Chulu scene, sympoiesis applies to nature and culture that exist in a system of co-creation. 
the living and non-living, the biological and artificial, form interdependent relationships of making wit. Recognition of sympoiesis requires a constant reconsideration of the life and death cycles of our human peers and non-human helpers. We must re reimagine our relationship to technical objects, the computers, the code that runs within as existing in symbiosis with the community who creates, maintains, and uses technologies. Learning from Haraway's definition of sympoiesis, we can understand non-living things that are always connecting to the living. We are co-creating a world with the non-living, such as the computers which use binary representation. In a flux between the existential state of being, which is one, and non-being, which is zero. This flux is reflective of the cycles of life and death, a circular progression of existence in the living and non-living. Between the technical objects and social thoughts lies conceptual and physical connectivity. Social organization and creations determining that which is given life and between creations and use or abuse of resources, that which is subject to death. The maintenance of this precarious ecosystem of life and death is presently unmet in part due to conception of community and mutual responsibility that is limited to our immediate surroundings or human kins. Adrian Murray Brown wrote in her 2017 book, nothing in nature is disposable. Part of the resilience of nature is that nothing is weighted. There are toxic materials and yet, yet nothing is disposable. The cycle of life ultimately makes use of everything. And this type of thinking was really important for me, especially working on this exhibition during the pandemic and unable to travel in the way that we used to, and yet trying to connect with other folks through international collaboration and community engagement. And I think it's also important to say that this idea and practices are not entirely my own. It's part of, I'm inspired by my collaborators and my students, my teachers and everyone who have touched my life. And I want to say that, um, you know, like I can't name everyone at this particular moment, but especially there are two communities that I'm indebted to. The first is the e-textiles community. There are a whole group of practitioners who look at electronic textiles and create garments and artworks. And I was part of a really amazing camp two years ago called e-textile spring break, which really opened my eyes about this craft and beauty of um, this field. And I'm also indebted to the School for Poetic Computation. 
it's a very small and unique school that I helped start in 2013. And the students and staff of the school have created works with textile in many different ways that I've learned so much. Recently, I stepped down from my role as an administrator, partly uh, to make space for the new leaders and also partly to take accountability of um, not being really, not really fulfilling our mission of transparency and racial justice. And um, we had a really difficult time of internal change. And that process was really hard, but also is really vital to, to reflect on things that I've done wrong and to trying to unlearn those things, such as issues of white supremacy and ableism and sexism. So I think this drawing really speaks true to how I feel about, we need to learn, but we need to unlearn and we need to resist, but we also need to repair. That oscillation of these practices should be our aim, not the final destination. A few folks that I'm indebted to, um, especially with the work that I was citing, um, the, essay, what, the essay that I worked on with Shannon Mattern um, and with help of Shira Feldman is on this book called The Bauhaus Futures. It's called The Wuben Circuit. And it was one of the beginning point for me to think about textiles and code. And my amazing friend, uh, Ireti Akin Akirinande. And I think she really helped me to write this piece called Community Code last year, which really helped capture the moment of the COVID-19 world. And amazing staff at chat, they are so great and good to work with. And I just want to have a dim sum with them if possible. <laughs> And my studio team, um, you know, I work with a very large team, really incredible artists and designers and engineers, and none of these would be possible without them. And particularly Jemin Shin and Suhyun Choi, who have been really integral to conceptualizing and execution of this exhibition. So that's it from me. And to transition to Alex, he is a, He's a, I mean, I thought he was a programmer who became a philosopher. And I learned it was actually the other way around. He was a philosopher who became programmer or maybe at the same time. But I met him about, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago when he was making a really interesting game inspired by Guy Debord's um, kind of philosophical game. And since then, I followed his work, um, which touches on this idea of a digital in a profoundly philosophical way and also political way. And a lot of my thinking is inspired by his work and in reaction to, in response to his. So we would do these kind of very punk, um, kind of a anarchist inspired lecture series in New York, in empty warehouses and in the parks, especially during the Occupy days. And then um, I guess now the Zoom is the open free space or the privately owned public space <laughs> as they, use, they usually say. Um, and happy to introduce Alex. And I guess we're gonna transition right onto Amy after that, but Amy's work is incredible. And I'm really excited to hear about um, her research, especially this idea of a female writing as they relate to textile. And I'm really delighted to pass on the mic to Alex and Amy. Thank you. Great, thank you, Taeyun. Um, it's so great to see your work and you've been such a great collaborator um, over the years. So. Um, it's wonderful that we can be together again, and um, it's a pleasure to meet 
um, Amy Chan and, and read some of her work. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Bruce Lee and all the people at chat in Hong Kong for setting up the event um, and acknowledge my friend, uh, the art historian, Ty Smith, who first alerted me um, several years ago already, I guess, to the work of Ada Dietz, whom I'll be discussing a little bit um, today and who I've, who I've been writing about. Um, Okay, so we're here to, uh, you know, talk about um, interweaving poetic code. Um, and so I've been thinking about the relation between weaving and coding, um, when and how weaving became enmeshed with computation. Um, it's a difficult question, it's a huge question. Weaving, of course, is very old. Uh, it's also completely international with the Chinese silk industry exerting great influence historically, along with the tapestries and rugs of Central and Southern Asia, um, and the many dyes and textiles sourced through colonial networks and the exploitation of minerals and plants and people. And among weavers, much reverence is reserved for the Andean weavers in the area of Peru uh, whose skill was unmatched. For instance, Annie Albers, the protege weaver of the Bauhaus, who would help insinuate weaving into the rarefied confines of modern art, dedicated her, dedicated her influential book called On Weaving, the culminating statement of her life's work, to quote, my great teachers, the weavers, of ancient Peru. Now as to when and how weaving became enmeshed with computation, I think the explanation is both sort of startlingly obvious and stubbornly elusive. So since 1953, at least with the publication of B. V. Bowden's Faster Than Thought, pride of place has been given to one Ada Augusta, the Countess of Lovelace, also known as Ada Lovelace. Um, and she was the daughter of Lord Byron. And attention given to her sort of pivotal role in the development of calculating machines. And Ada Lovelace adorns the frontispiece of Bowdoin's book and is discussed throughout. And indeed the computing pioneer, um, Alan Turing had already mentioned Ada Lovelace a few years earlier in his influential 1950 essay titled Computing Machinery and Intelligence. For it was Lovelace who understood the power of the Jacquard punched cards which computer pioneer Charles Babbage had grafted onto his calculating engine in three places. And it was Lovelace who wrote a, um, the most sophisticated gloss kind of interpretation of Babbage's proto computer and who itemized a sequence of operations that one might execute on that machine, thereby creating if you will, a kind of software. And it remains very speculative because Babbage never built his machine. So it's a kind of virtual software code on top of a non-existing virtual machine, which is interesting. And so by 1977, computer scientist Herman Goldstein would without hesitation refer to Lovelace as quote, the world's first programmer. Lovelace herself also offered um, a kind of analogy between the loom and the computer. Uh, and she referenced Jacquard and his system a few times in her famous notes, the, 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 this sort of gloss that she wrote about Babbage's machine. Um, as in the following passage I'll read, uh, which is uh, probably the most frequently quoted line uh, ever penned by, um, by Ada Lovelace. Um, because it has this very beautiful image and I'll read it here. Um, the distinctive characteristic of the analytical engine, that's Babbage's machine, 
is the introduction into it of the principle which Jacquard devised for regulating by means of punched cards the most complicated patterns in the fabrication of brocaded stuffs. And here's the famous line. We may say most aptly that the analytical engine weaves algebraical patterns just as the Jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. So keep that in your mind because we'll come back to that in, in, a, in a minute or two here. Now, among her accomplishments, um, as, I, as I just mentioned, Lovelace wrote an important um, interpretive text on Babbage's engine. And uh, a lot of attention has been given to this uh, so-called note G. Um, and the, the, the centerpiece here is this table of instructions. And it's very technical and kind of obtuse, but um, as one historian put it, uh, Lovelace's table is what computer scientists would now call an execution trace. Meaning it documented the state of the machine as it changed through a series of performed operations. So the execution trace is just a way of sort of documenting or following the series of, of, of um, uh, operations that the machine is executing. And in looking at this, it, it struck me how similar this looked to um, uh, what weavers call the treadling sequence of draft notation. So weaving has an interesting and kind of complicated notation system that includes how you thread the machine, but also how you, you treadle or push with your feet uh, uh, the different, the different um, treadles uh, on the loom. And it struck me that, that Lovelace's note G looks very, very similar to the treadling sequence of draft notation. And as the art historian Ty Smith put it, um, the draft notation is something like an image of practice for weavers. It tells us not how the textile will look so much as the technical operation through which it is made. It is something of an algorithmic code as image. And I'll show you a draft notation in a second. So I think, you know, it may be speculative here, but I think Lovelace was in, in a sense writing draft notation. And if, if you will kind of treadling um, the, the, the Babbage machine, um, just as a weaver might treadle a loom. So I'll just, I'll flag one interesting aspect of Lovelace's note G, um, which is a technique um, that she called uh, backing. So this is a technique that, that was called backing. And um, while she admired Jacquard's system, Lovelace nevertheless determined that Jacquard's use of punch cards, quote, was not found to be sufficiently powerful for all the varied and complicated processes as those required in order to fulfill the purposes of an analytical engine, unquote. And so she developed this, this technique called backing. So what's going on here? Well, the, um, you can imagine a, a punched card uh, adopted from the Jacquard system. And the punch card contains a certain kind of pattern that can be read by the loom and it controls how the warp uh, threads are moved up and down. Um, and so, you know, there's different ways to do this, but you can imagine a series of these cards and, you know, these cards are, um, are basically read in by the machine um, and, uh, you know, moving in a, certain, in a certain direction the machine can interpret these patterns and then that affects the operation of the machine. And what Lovelace did essentially was, it seems very simple maybe to us now, but um, seeing the shortcoming of this, she developed this technique called backing, which is essentially to sort of rotate um, the, the prism that was interpreting these cards to rotate it backwards rather than forwards. And then this backward sequence could allow um, some of the cards basically to be read again. And she developed essentially, we could say a kind of um, looping technique. So 
it could be executing forward and then it could go backward uh, a couple cards maybe it even goes backward a few times right and then it could go forward it could go backward again um, and so you can see the execution uh, 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 using this technique of backing um, ends up being very, very different. Um, we could even say maybe that this is sort of, you know, has a, has a relationship to um, the, the notorious um, uh, go-to command in, in coding, which, which created problems uh, for other reasons. Or we could even say that this has a relationship to a, 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 what we just call a for loop or even a, or even a while loop. Um, in, in contemporary um, contexts. So, so that to me is just kind of one little window into um, what was kind of going on in this note G and maybe a relationship between um, the, the loom and, and this early computational device. So um, I wanna maybe show something else that's a little bit, maybe doesn't seem like it connects, but I, but I, hope, I hope it does connect. Um, which is the idea of a fork bomb. So what is a, what is a fork bomb? Well, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you have a little application or a little script or something, you can execute it and it runs as a process. And um, so one of the things you could potentially do with this process is to quote unquote fork it. Um, and the fork command is about basically spawning a copy when a process spawns a copy of itself. And you're seeing here a kind of text output of a very simple um, fork bomb that looks like this. Um, it's just a simple, um, you could even collapse this into a single line of code and run it in a terminal, but this is just a few lines of code written in a um, language called Perl. And so the idea here is that, um, let me see if I can just kind of outline how this, this might work. Um, let's say you have a process, you know, just a script or, or some simple um, uh, piece of software. And let's say it's just kind of executing through time. And the way this one's set up is it's, it's running a loop. So it's looping over and over and over again and you have a series of just different kind of repetitive decisions that are made. And um, the way the fork bomb works is that every time this loops, it forks a copy of itself. It forks a copy of itself every time through, through this loop. And it is quite literally a copy of itself. So, this second line is another identical process and it's running in parallel. This third line is an identical process and it's running in parallel, the fourth and fifth and so on. Okay, so that seems interesting. Maybe creating some weird chaotic behavior inside the machine, uh, that seems interesting. But keep in mind, these are identical copies, which means the second one is also forking every loop. And this third one is also forking every loop and I'm running out of paper. The fourth one is also forking every loop. So you can see that very, very rapidly you get this sort of unbridled uh, growth within, this is all happening within the computer's memory. You get this kind of unbridled growth. And so this is why it's called a fork bomb is that it can be very explosive. You can do a lot with a little and um, you can crash your computer very easily, um, which isn't saying much. Computers are very easy to crash. Um, what's hard is to sort of strangle them in beautiful ways. Um, so the key with the fork bomb is you have to um, build in sort of death conditions. Um, you have to build in a termination condition. So each one of these processes um, at a certain point will, will stop. Um, otherwise, you will very quickly run out of memory and your computer will, will crash. So there's different ways to do this, but in the video that I just showed you, every one of these processes is printing. Okay, and so um, they're all, what's interesting is they're all printing kind of to the same out. And so that's why you see this kind of semi chaotic behavior, you know, computers are very deterministic, it's hard to do true randomness, but here you see a kind of semi chaotic behavior 
Um, and what I love is, you know, what's determining this chaotic behavior? Well, it's, it's literally things like, you know, how hot is the motherboard right now, right? And that will make these kind of micro, um, it, will, it will affect the, 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 the operation of the machine in these extremely small kind of micro ways that might allow, um, you know, it to run more quickly or more slowly. I'll show you the beginning of this video and you see that the output is very dense. And so the motherboard is maybe a little cooler at this point and it's working in a different way. Um, and you get this sort of outcome that's very unpredictable. And so I love this about, about the fork bombs that they produce these kinds of interesting aesthetic qualities. You have the, the, the question of looping, similar to backing. Um, you have repetition. You have these weird combinatorial effects. And then a way to kind of, you know, maybe not randomness, but sort of deal with a kind of unpredictableness um, in how, you know, um, the machine is, is interpreting very, you know, what ends up being a very simple, sometimes very uh, short amount of, of code. Okay. So fork bombs aren't like weaving, but I do think they bring out some kind of similar questions and they, and they, and they, it's a way to maybe bring in the text side that Tayun already mentioned, the text side. And it also, I think, um, focuses our attention on like, what is a pixel? Um, and I think the question of what is a pixel in, in weaving is an, is an interesting uh, question that's not, doesn't have a very obvious answer. Okay. So, okay. So I'm gonna move to it, to something completely different now. So we, we jump from one ADA to another ADA. And we're gonna jump forward from 100 years, um, jumping forward from London circa 1840 to Detroit, Michigan in the early uh, 1940s. And there uh, we have one Ada Dietz, Ada Dietz, a school teacher on the verge of retirement, soon to turn 60 years old, no children, never married. And she decided to change her life and begin again. And on the suggestion of her close friend, Ruth Foster, and you see them pictured here, Dietz enrolled in a weaving class offered at Wayne State University um, to study textile art under the tutelage of Nellie Sargent Johnson, who is a veteran weaver and prolific author and publisher on the subject um, in the US. And Dietz uh, quickly excelled at the craft um, and she ended up leaving her life behind. She left her, her job at a, at, a, at a high school that she'd been working at her whole life. Um, she left behind her sorority sisters from the University of Michigan uh, and, and decamped to the sunny, um, uh, to sunny California. And once out west, in close collaboration with Foster, Dietz would go on to create her own approach to designing draft patterns for textiles, which is an unusual technique um, based on translating simple algebraic expressions into two-dimensional patterns of interlaced warp and weft. And I'll show you what some of those look like in a second. Um, here's, here's a quote from one journalist that I think kind of sets the scene nicely. Um, in a sunlit hobby room, opening on a charming patio, a mathematician and an artist happily combine their talents to produce textiles of originality and beauty. So Foster is the artist and Dietz is the mathematician. Quote, in their cheery hobby room with its walls tinted in a delicate shade of green, where looms of many sizes occupy the floor spaces, there are drawers filled almost to overflowing with yarns and threads in a riot of shades and colors like Joseph's coat. 
And so I've been spending some time researching um, Ada Dietz and trying to understand her technique. Um, and I'll just try to describe it really quickly here. Um, maybe the best way to do it would be to just show you quickly a kind of sampler I worked on, um, which uh, this is an image of um, me just looking at the pattern, uh, which is in the bottom right and just confirming using a software simulator um, whether that would actually, um, whether my interpretation of it and the way I was planning to dress the loom would actually work. Um, you see here just an example of the algebraic technique that she used, which I'll describe, but um, you can see a kind of interference pattern um, going left to right in the weft threads, and then also a similar interference pattern going top to, top to bottom. So that's kind of the, the key that she's dealing with here is using um, different variables um, to create these almost like wave interference patterns where these two variables are, are kind of interfering with each other. Um, so let me just like try to draw out or, or, or I can even just show this slide here and might explain it a little better. So the key to um, Ada Dietz's work is that <clears throat> She started with um, algebra. So she started with um, these kind of polynomial expressions that you see at the top. Um, and this is the most complicated one that, maybe not the most, but it's, this is her sort of marquee piece that she used, um, um, that she created in her lifetime, which uh, has uh, six variables in this polynomial and it is raised to the second power. And we don't need to go super detailed here, but basically she would just do a normal expansion, like she would have taught her high school students how you expand an algebraic expression into its larger notation. Um, that's sort of what you see in the middle here. And then at the bottom, she would kind of creatively um, remap or rewrite um, the, the, al the algebraic expression into a series of um, letters. So you see a squared just becomes a a, 2ab becomes a b a b, 2ac becomes a c a c, and that's how she is able to expand um, this algebraic expression into um, a single long string. Okay, and why is she, why does she want to do this? Um, well, the answer is that she's trying to create a, a draft pattern that has some kind of like complexity built into it. And, um, and, sh and so algebra was sort of her tool to create and generate um, these, these patterns. Um, and I'll read from uh, uh, one computer scientist and weaving enthusiast, um, Ralph Griswold, who was analyzing um, Ada Dietz's uh, work and this 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 exp this technique of um, creating draft patterns from algebraic expressions, and he looked at these and he gave these a special name. He called them uh, Dietz polynomials. Dietz polynomials, um, and he uh, you know in in one of his texts he he made a calculation that if you make these polynomials big enough and if you raise them to certain powers, um, you can create these massive non-repeating um, pattern strings that you can use as, um, as uh, a way to dress the loom. And he calculated that a rather large Dietz polynomial with nine variables, right? The one I just showed you was six, raised to a power of the sixth power would generate a non-repeating fabric pattern over three miles wide. So you would need a very large uh, loom in order to weave that particular um, pattern. So yeah, just, just to kind of wrap up, I'll just, just show you what kind of resulted from this, from this research project. Um, it was um, my attempt to recreate Ada Dietz's kind of marquee uh, work, which is uh, what I just showed you, which is called AKD62SW. And she had a kind of encoding scheme um, all her own to determine the titles of her works. 
Um, and she, she experimented, experimented with all sorts of different equi uh, equations in the late 1940s. Um, she frequently worked on a, a four harness loom, but to get to this kind of uh, complicated virtuosic final piece, um, she had to switch to an eight um, harness loom. And she worked in the so-called um, summer and winter technique. I mean, that's what, what it's called here. I don't know. I don't know what that's understood more broadly, but the so-called summer and winter technique, which as you can see is, is a way to create almost like pixels, although they're actually blocks. Um, they're blocks of, of, of threads, but they do create these, these kind of um, blocks that almost resemble pixels and allow um, you know, the weaver to make you know, specific textures or perhaps even primitive um, pictorial um, you know, patterns in, in the work. Um, and uh, so I think that maybe just, just, to, just to end, I'll just kind of note some of the striking um, aspects of this composition, which again is generated from these, these algebraic um, expressions. And you can see that she, she, she started with a, a border at the top, which we can just kind of overlook for the time being. But if you look at this sort of central area, um, and you see there's this kind of strong axis. Um, so what are we looking at? Well, we're kind of looking at a mathematical space. We're looking at a, a kind of interference pattern between variables. And this, this mathematic space is mapped onto two dimensions. And then it's sort of, it's sort of clipped or capped into either being in the off position or the on, on position. And so you can see it creates these kind of beautiful, almost fractal patterns. Um, this sort of square space up here is then is then sort of um, you know reappears here and then it gets kind of smaller and smaller and smaller and you can see that there are these kind of like tendrils that are also um, spinning off to the side right and these those also kind of mimic each other and get smaller and smaller and so I think what are we looking at is this a pattern is this a picture um, it's a question of texture or pictorial elements in, in, in weaving is I think a big, a big debate. Um, what is this a picture of if it's a picture? Well, the answer might simply be, I don't know, some snippet of mathematical space rendered visible. Maybe this is a picture of pattern itself. And this is a quote uh, that I'll just end with from Ada Dietz. Uh, she said, as patterns grow and the possibilities opened up, I found that mathematics gave the beautiful space divisions, proportions and individuality of pattern, which the artist strikes to achieve. And so maybe this is, um, you know, maybe the notion is that she was sort of spatializing algebra or spatializing math and in so doing, um, rendering code visible, maybe we could say, um, in this sort of alternation of colors in, in two dimensions. So uh, thanks for listening. Um, I look forward to the discussion and I will uh, pass it over to Amy now. Thank you. So, um... Thank you, Taeyong and Alex, for the wonderful talks. So they, both of them are artists. They have uh, a lot of their work to show, uh, but I, I don't have any because I'm not artistic at all. And I'm so excited to take part in this presentation with them. And I would like to thank Bruce and Eugenia for bringing me into this project. I have seen some of Taeyong's works online and found them very impressive. I never thought that the two words poetic and computation can be put together. And I'm deeply moved by his project on care in a technological future, where he aims at, I quote, focusing on personhood in relation to accessibility, identity, and the environment with the intention of creating a distributed future that is built with 
trust and care where diverse communities are prioritized and supported, end quote. By diverse uh, communities, I think we may refer to all minoritarians, such as female, colored people, LGBTQ+, as well as other earth beings, such as plants, animals, stones, and machines. And to use Donna Haraway's concept, we have to make kin with them. Given the topic of this keynote presentation, we are focusing on kinship among human, weaving computer and writing code. And to that, I will add Chinese culture as a kind of minor knowledge. And the theme of this exhibition is the interconnection between weaving and computer as exemplified. Oh, I have to share my screen first. So exemplified in this image, uh, this is one of my most favorite image. Um, and somehow I can't uh, find it online again. This is a city plant working on a weaving loom and this weaving loom is with uh, zeros and ones. And I would like to introduce a form of writing that is based on an embroidery pattern. It is called nu shu. Um, which literally means female writing. And this unique form of writing was discovered in the 1980s in Hunan province in China. So far, it is the first and the only attempt made, a successful attempt made by females to create a language of their own. There are different sayings concerning the origin of this writing system but it is generally accepted that it was created in the Zhong dynasty. So the female writing is usually practiced by women of a minority group called Yao in, the, uh, in Hunan province. And up to today, uh, we can take a look at the weaving loom. Uh, up to today, they are still using this uh, very primitive uh, spinning wheels, but they are very similar to this spinning wheel, which was used in the Western Han Dynasty. So they are like um, more than 2000 years ago, but you can see that they are still very similar. And the women in Hunan called this writing system female writing as opposed to the Han Chinese writing system, they call it male writing. And to trace the origin of female writing, we have to understand that even women living in village nowadays may not be literate and not to mention the women back in Zhong dynasty because men always enjoyed the privilege of formal education. And being illiterate in Han writing, women devised their own writing and passed it on to their daughters, their granddaughters, so that when they got married and left home, they could communicate among themselves and write, their, write letters or write their own literary works. And though linguists, oh, sorry, though linguists show that this female writing system is a variation from the male writing, and they consider that it's a dialect rather than a language, the style of this writing system looked very different from the male writing, from the Chinese characters. And the Chinese characters are made up, uh, is on the left side on the screen. They are made up mostly by vertical and horizontal lines. And every character fits in a rectangle. On the other hand, if you look 
at the writing on the right hand side of the screen. These are the female writing characters. They are made up of dots, curves, and slating lines, tilting to the left. And instead of forming a rectangle, they are rhombus shaped. Another interesting finding about the female writing is that it does not look like any writing system in Chinese history, including the Han Chinese writing systems and all the writings of the minority groups. Another explanation concerning the creation of this writing relates to relates it to weaving. It claims that women in the past, they always gathered and did weaving and embroidery together. Due to the hardships in their married lives, they wanted to record their experiences and sufferings. However, since they were illiterate, they embroidered some symbols on the cloth as a mark or record. The symbols were gradually developed into a writing system. So these are the embroidery done by the Yale women, the, uh, the minority group women. And if we take a look at them, we can see that the patterns are similar to the writing. And the contents of the female writing can be categorized into six areas. So um, the first one is religious rites. Women write down their prayers and wishes on the paper, folding, um, folding fan and bring it to the temple for burning. Number two is entertainment. Women have picnics together. They read and sing their own writings. So uh, in, it's not just a writing system. They have sound. So, um, but they don't really talk in that language. Instead, they read out the letters or literary works. So uh, they write their own writings, including folk songs, biographies, and letters. And number three is communication. So um, they had this culture of forming sworn sisters with good friends. And they usually communicate with each other by letters. Number four is biography. Elder women would ask someone who is good at female writing to write their biography for them before they passed away. And these books are usually laments of their hardships in their married life, especially in the husband's um, household. And these books are usually burned at the woman's cremation so that she could continue to read it and to sing it in the another world. And that explains why no female writing book survived. So um, most of them were cremated with the women and most of the female writing records that we still have nowadays, they were written after the Qing dynasty. So they actually had a quite a short history, like 200 to 300 years. Number five is to write the, it's not history, it's her story. So um, they also wrote about the historical events, but it's very different from the history in capital letter. So it's almost, it's like the oral history, talking about their own experiences in the wartime or during some kind of upheavals in history. Number six is rewriting of narrative poems. So women chose some poems which have women as protagonists and uh, rewrite them into a female writing with a different perspective and also a different focus. And I would also like to talk a little bit about the materials on which this female writing was usually written on. So since they did not, the women did not have access to paper and they were not supposed to write letters to friends. So actually this female writing has been kept sec very secretive. They could not let men know that they actually wrote to each other. So they had to 
uh, write this on the silk handkerchief and you can see that some of this is not even writing. They are embroidery. So uh, they sent this handkerchiefs to their friends um, so as not to arouse suspicion. And the fabric constituted by the perpendicular and parallel yards is an ordered, controlled, and closed space. And writing on this space inevitably disrupts its hierarchical order. The female writing usually runs vertically from right to left and hence cuts across this hierarchical pattern of the fabric. And making the signs of the female writing on the fabric is an act to, uh, in the list terms, to smooth a three-eight space. And on the other hand, um, the paper are made by vegetal fib fabrics and water is a smooth space. So the calligraphy of male writing on paper, no matter horizontally or vertically, always from right to left, I argue, is to stratify this chaotic and smooth space. So um, smoothing this So smoothing of space is always associated with feminine space. And feminine space is by definition a structure for what does not yet exist. It is constituted by continuous movement, lines of flight, deterritorialization, and reterritorialization. In short, it is always a becoming. And writing and weaving, I would think that have empowered women in different ways, but uh, women, um, they gained some kind of power for liberation or right or just to write their bodies to write their own self through some uh, through this kind of female writing. So um, that's my sharing of this uh, female writing. And so now we'll open the floor for discussion. So we'll take our uh, stop sharing first. So uh, we welcome questions. Or so maybe while our audience, they are typing in their questions. Can I start with one first? Okay. Uh, so my question is for uh, Tae Young. Now you said that um, technology is a matter of coexistence. Can be, can act as a matter of coexistence. So um, how to turn technology from a tool, from an instrument to a vibrant matter? Because even nowadays, I think a lot of people, they take technology as a tool and, or an instrument to achieve some kind of ends only. So how can we turn it as some kind of vibrant matter? Hmm. Well, I mean, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> I, I try to search for that question myself. And I, I think I think it's quite obvious what matters are not vibrant. I think the ways that technology is either seen as a threat for humanity, and you get a lot of that with discussions around AI and you know kind of any new technology that comes as a threat to our livelihood or our personhood, or it's seen as a merely disposable um, extension of our physical tool. So, and there's a, pro there's a th problem with the second part of seeing technology only as a tool because it discredits 
for example, the human labor involved with any technology or materiality, the thingness of all the digital stuff, right? I think my experience of going to knitting factory and seeing the workers actually undo the mistakes of the machine was quite revealing about the vibrancy of their presence, their labor, their attention to details and their absolute necessity for the human to complete the work of the machine. Um, I, I think a lot about repair these days because I'm sure we are using one of the smart devices to be online right now. And, you know, like we just cannot repair stuff. Like we, like I can't repair my phone or can't change the battery of my laptop. And that's decision from the corporation to make matters not vibrant, to have a finite lifespan. And I think those are some of the clues that I'm working with. And I got really excited about this subculture of people who use old phones. There are people who are like intentionally get like nine year old iPhones and almost like they're like the kind of people who ride, ride like antique cars. They just like try to make sure that the iPhone does not die. But um, it's, it's quite challenging because the, it's, the software does not want to up, upgrade and your security your personal information is vulnerable if you don't update the operating system. And there's a kind of a, a limit to how old uh, phones you could use. So the one method is the act of resistance and the other is the repair. And I think some of the artists that we've invited are approaching this. Yeah. It seems that when you are talking about repair, it's not just repair of the iPhone repair of a computer, you're talking more about repair of the relationship between human beings and all the other things, right? Yeah. But but I do think iPhone battery repair is important. <laughs> I, I think I, I think that speaks to all of the relationship with the whole society. Actually, like the fact that our you know you know our personhood is attached to such a small device, but we have a very limited access to. Um, kind of repairing it and yeah and we have a question from our audience is for uh, Taeyong when you raise the process of unlearning what potentials do you see how would your unlearning work in collaboration with machines and other immaterial engagements yeah thank you for that question um I mean, unlearning is, is not anything special. It really is just asking why you're learning and how you're learning. So in practical sense, it's just not taking things for granted. And for example, if you're learning to code, you may want to ask, why am I learning code? Why does code have certain language that has a lineage to slavery? such as like in code, it's quite often to say like master and slave to talk about computers at different hierarchy. And that's quite problematic, right? It, it's just to ask what is seemed obvious because the technologies reflect the society and people who made it. So it embeds the racism and sexism, which, you know, it, it manifests as one of those commands such as a master and slave and people are changing it there's a lot of activists who are actively kind of questioning these and i think those are the process of unlearning for me is to ask questions so thank you tayo for this answer and there is a very long question for alex I think I can say one or two things because I had a chance to read it. Um, yeah, the question is about uh, op art and and this sort of um, oscillation patterns. And, and I think that's, yeah, I think that's key, you know, and, um, you know, sort of like Tiyun was hinting at the, at the top, you know, weaving 
fiber arts are very complicated. People use looms in really different ways, but in a, in a sort of conventional sense, you know, weaving is very um, sort of militant and, 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 and uh, precise and requires an intense level of um, sort of um, organization, like material organization, right? Which again, doesn't mean you can't deviate from that. But um, I think of, uh, you know, the magic of weaving is basically how do you go from two, from linear, basically from, from like a linear technology into a two-dimensional technology. So you have spun, spun uh, fiber somehow. And then how do you go from that linear materiality into two-dimensional? And there are a lot of different ways to do it. I mean, knitting does it very differently. Um, but, 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 but I love this notion of kind of, of, of like locking, like um, the, the threads are sort of um, locked against each other. And, and that's what creates the stability of the flat plane in, in the two-dimensional weave. And so I think it's the alternation that you're getting at with your question um, oscillation, the wobble, you know, one thread is going above and then below and then above and then below. And yeah, that's a sort of alternation technique that creates the, the temporary stability of this linear technology existing in a, in a, in a, in a two-dimensional technology. Thank you, Alex. Um, and another question for Alex. What potentials do you see in the future of collaboration be of programming and fabrics? And do you see 3D printing as the potential successor to this collaboration? Gosh, that's a great question. I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that. Um, I'm very much a you know hobbyist amateur when it comes to weaving. Um, and I have never done any 3D printing in my life, so, <laughs> but, uh, that's a great question. Maybe, maybe Amy or Tayun have have thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I think there are really interesting work being done in that space with uh, additive manufacturing, which is like the way that three D printing works is just printing, or I like to say, pooping one pixel at a time <laughs> on top of each other. Um, and there are like people who are programming robot arms to make weaving, and that's really fascinating. Um, I think a lot of architects and designers are exploring this space for kind of different ways of manufacturing the built environment. Um, I guess, like, I, I can respond to another one of the questions is that, um, why is it not just active learning? Why does it have to be unlearning? Okay, so the question was like, why do I choose the word unlearning as opposed to active or conscious learning? And I guess I, I will spin this to talk about the concept of uncomputable, which Alex and I worked on a few years ago. And we got excited about this idea of uh, computability and uncomputability. And uncomputability is not just like, like this computing or not, um, it's not, it doesn't strictly mean like not being able to compute. I think this idea of un, like UN, actually has more of a agency in which we can resist being computed. In times when like society and the technologies just want to compute all of our interactions, I think uncomputability is a way of like kind of preserving our freedom and also possibility. So I think that relates to unlearning is that I think, you know, there are so many online education and different ways of sharing information these days, but the real question is like, you know, is that all necessary? And what are the ways that we could change how we learn? And I, I think I've been learning algebra. <laughs> I totally missed out on my high school math. So like, I'm like relearning middle school and high school math. And gosh, it's so beautiful. And it's, there's so much beauty and poetics there, but I did not know that when I was learning um, in high school. So I guess that's a form of unlearning on my end as well. 
So thank you, Taeyong. And I think I'm learning. Uh, I agree with Taeyong that it is not about not learning any anything or active learning is to unlearn what you know what you knew before and actually is a kind of reflective so you, you reflected on what you have learned and you also questioned whether it is something that you should learn or if that is the right way to learn it and then we have uh, another question uh, weaving and knitting are often regarded as craft. Do you regard craft as a form or art? And why is that for either case? And it addresses to all panel members. I had a I had a professor in college who was a textile artist, and he had this saying like he said in a passing where he was like oh the curators think my work is too crafty and <laughs> that was so interesting i mean his work was really beautiful and conceptual but it involved a lot of hand handcraft and i think the curators that he was talking to were dismissive about the craft nature of his work i mean i have so much respect for craft and people who exercise craft. I think it's very meaningful to explore the labor, the materiality and the time of the craft. So I think it's a form and also artistic practice and uh, process as well. So I think it could be interpreted in any ways. And you went to art school, right, Tayon? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I've never really identified as an artist. I didn't go to art school. Um, I think there's obviously a sort of like a moral or normative dynamic where if you say something is art, you're, you're you know, heaping praise on it. So art becomes a kind of honorific and I have always identified more as a craftsperson. And I think that's maybe a way to think, um, you know, and you can think of craft in a lot of different domains, right? Like, like uh, there could be a craft of thinking. Um, there could be a craft, you know, craft could be a part of coding um, or, or a way of approaching coding. Um, it could be a way of approaching building things that could be in wood or fiber or other other domains. So um, I'm, I'm always kind of rooting for for craft over art, in fact. <laughs> um, but actually, I had a question for Amy, too, if there's still time. I was really fascinated by your presentation. And I and I love how there's a kind of it's it's almost difficult to differentiate between a picture and a texture and writing. And maybe you could just say more about those three things, because I think weaving sort of mixes and, and collides those domains in interesting ways. Um, your question about picture and writing. Well, I think the, the female um, writing uh, is a form of writing more like the weaving or the, uh, it's not like weaving, it's like the embroidery pattern. And that's why it looks more like images than the male writing. And I think that is also what the women aimed to do because they had to hide this from the men. So they made their characters really look like uh, rhombus shaped and um, the embroidery pattern. And uh, actually in uh, the another version of my paper, I compared it to another minority group's writing, which is famous or infamous for the number of strokes because just one character, you may have like 90 strokes. <laughs> it's almost like impossible to learn how to write it. So that one is highly, I, I would say is highly stratified. But 
the female writing is trying to de-stratify the space that they are writing on. So uh, in fact, um, but it's too bad that we are running out of time. I wanted to ask Alex and Taeyong, how do you compare, because we are, it, it seems that we are always suggesting weaving and computer, they are very similar. They share some kind of um, similarities in the origin. But in terms of striator smooth space, how do you compare this to space? We still have three minutes, so. I mean, I, I think we can kind of yes. get a little, use a little bit more time. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the question? Like, so how do you compare to the spatial experiences? No, because when we are saying that they are, um, one is the, the warp and the wolf and the other is the zeros and ones. But for us, it's quite obvious that fabrics are striated space, right? There are the horizontal lines and the vertical lines. But in computer, like the um, what Alex just showed us, we have, we, it's true that we have just the, the ones and the zeros is actually invisible. But then with this ones and zeros, we can create fractal geometry, we can create virtual space, cyberspace in a computer. So even though these two forms are very similar in their origin, but how do you compare this to space? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's inherently a spatial technology. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I mean, there's probably different ways of thinking about this, um, but the um, you know the 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 creating a discrete difference, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether that's in linear space or in um, two dimensional space. Yeah, I think that's something that's kind of at the heart of a lot of these themes, textile, text, weaving, absolutely. I, I asked this question because um, I, I'm doing cyber feminism. So there is always this argument whether cyberspace, the matrix can be a space for women to get some kind of liberation, um, to be free from patriarchy. But on the opposite side, people are arguing that no cyberspace, as Taeyong said, is just like the real world full of all forms of discrimination, white supremacy, um, ableism, patriarchy. I mean, yeah, I've been thinking about that. <laughs> like, just the, um, I mean, somehow, like, being in this tech art space got me to meet a lot of people who made the internet, like the San Francisco, like, Silicon Valley folks from the 60s, and also like the blockchain bros who are just like everywhere now. And, you know, like the rhetorics of the, even like the rhetorics of the cyber feminism gets co-opted in certain ways. And you, as you said, those alternative spaces are oftentimes occupied by the white male um, imaginations first, first, uh, almost like this colonial approach to the new space and very much about the frontierism of trying to go to the Mars and go to the new blockchain space or AI space. But I think that should not stop us I think, I think um, alternatives and resistance need to be, um, it need to take place in corporations, academia, as well as art spaces. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking a lot about the coexistence <laughs> of different ideology in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And how do we interface between them? 
and so that so that uh, that leads to more generative um, change over time. It's still tricky because it's usually the marginalized people who have to do the hard work and they end up suffering the most out of the work. But I don't know, I, I think I think the relationship to physical protests are quite revealing actually, like the Occupy Wall Street, for example, or a lot of the protests over the last 10 years. Yeah, I mean, it didn't really live on. It didn't change the society, but did it create a dent? Did it change the narrative? Did it create an image? And yes. And even those spaces were very, you know, masculine and very problematic, but I'm thinking a lot about the cracks as opposed to uh, valleys. So how do you create small cracks that becomes larger structural change? And I think the feminist spaces could be possible in technology as well in the same way. Um, certain cracks exist no matter how large the buildings are, how large the mountains are, there's always a crack. Thank you, Teo. So uh, we have overrun for 43 minutes. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Alex, Teo, and thanks uh, our uh, not, we still have 95 participants, so thank yeah. you for... <laughs> I mean, I think we're over just 10 minutes. I think it was a 90-minute program. But, uh, but people are just asking questions, so I'm really happy for that. And yes. I mean, Amy, like, could, I, could we ask you just a final word? Yes. Um, and I think there's a question from the chat, which says, Amy, to build on your question, I'm wondering if zooming out to the orthogonal grid of textile and observing it as a soft surface is similar to what you described with the orthogonal systems of ones and zeros in the computer allowing us to create fractals and spaces. Is this the question of scale slash resolution? This is coming from Maria. Do you wanna oh. have a moment to respond to that? Well, this one is, actually very technical, right? Because you're talking about the scale and also the resolution. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, actually I was talking about the material itself because we know that uh, fabric is made by the roof yard. So there are horizontal line and vertical lines and it's, not really about resolution. So if you're zooming out and then you're zooming in, then it has become another system. Um, but that question, if it applies to different kinds of different types of paper, then it's very interesting. Uh, again, in my another version of the paper on female writing, I analyzed different types of papers because in China, when they are doing calligraphy and also painting, they have a special type of paper. And this paper is, has its own characteristic. So for example, uh, it's very absorbent. And if the, with the right temperature and humidity, it can last for a hundred years. So, for that one, I think uh, this question will, will apply to paper more than fabric for me. I can just add one thing. Yeah, the question of scale is super, super interesting. Yes. Um, thinking about resolution um, <clears throat> is one way to think about scale. Um, so, you know, down scale, going down in scale is um, connected with uh, analysis, right? Analyzing and going upscale is connected with synthesis, sort of fusing. And that's why I, I always love the example of, of fractals, which have come up, I think, more than once already, um, because the fractal sort of breaks that logic, right? Where, where something is similar, self-similar similar at all, at any scale.
Great. Well, thanks, Alex and Amy. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, it was really fascinating. And I will just do my role of promoting the next few talks that are coming up. We have four more. <laughs> uh, I guess, yeah, I guess um, the chat staff will do that. Um, but uh, we have four more talks um, that are just really incredible. And I would lo love you to all check it out. And the topics range from very technical um, issues around textiles and technology to social change and idea of care. Our exhibition will open in May and it will run until July. And I think we'll try to have different ways of engaging um, virtually and physically. And yeah, just want to end the night for us uh, by saying thank you to chat staff and Amy and Alex.